the commander of the 155th Brigade Combat Team that is uh, currently deployed in Iraq and operating as part of the multinational force West. Uh, for nearly the past year, General Collins and his troops have been responsible for ongoing, oper uh, ongoing security operations uh, in North Babil, uh, Karbala, as well as Najaf provinces. Uh, he's prepared, as our other uh, presenters have been in the past, to give you a brief overview of what uh, his unit has been doing, and then we'll take some of your questions. So I know we got started just a tad bit late, so let's get right into it. General, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Whitman, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, of the press for allowing me to come and spend some time with you today and tell you a little bit about the 155 Brigade Combat Team. Of course, we're a brigade combat team that's primarily based out of Mississippi, but we also have soldiers from Arkansas, Vermont, Utah, Iowa, and Puerto Rico. We also have soldiers that from the active component. We have a squadron, a second squadron of the 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment from Fort Irwin, California, that's subordinate to our brigade. Our higher, our higher headquarters is the uh, Second Marine Expeditionary Force that's located out in Al Anbar Province. We arrived in theater in January of last of this year, January of 05, and uh, we actually had our transfer of authority at the first week of February. Uh, we have approximately 4,200 soldiers that make up this brigade combat team. And as Mr. Whitman said, we're, we're located in Najaf, Karbala, North Babel, and uh, we also have one task force that's in the eastern Al Anbar province. Since we've been in Iraq, we've uh, conducted many of operations. A lot of those operations have been combined with Iraqi security forces. To date, we've uh, conducted eight brigade level operations. 21 task force or, or battalion level operations and more than 500 company and platoon level operations. These operations have been designed to uh, capture or kill the insurgents or disrupt their operations as they try to uh, uh, inflict pain and, and suffering upon the, the people of Iraq. <coughs> we've been able to capture more than 1,500 terrorists during that period of time. Uh, we've seized 28,000 weapons. We've seized more than 18,000 pounds of munitions to include 8,000 pounds of explosives. We've worked very close with the citizens of Iraq to try and make a better way of life for them through their essential services. We completed many uh, construction projects. Uh, we provided clean drinking water for the citizens in places where they did not have it uh, prior to us getting here. The electrical services have improved. The uh, sanitation and sewer projects uh, have, have increased the, uh, the, the quality of life that the citizens now have in our area. We've done a number of health care projects, uh, renovating hospitals and uh, building uh, health care clinics in some of the rural areas of, uh, of Iraq uh, to help people who live outside the city and uh, don't have uh, access to, uh, to medical care. Uh, one thing we've also done with our doctors and our nurses and, and medics is we've done uh, medical civil affairs projects where our doctors and nurses would actually go out in some of the rural areas of, of, uh, of Iraq and provide uh, medical checkups to some of the citizens and also some, uh, some dental uh, repairs have been done during this period of time. Also, uh, humanitarian aid projects to include uh, food and clothing have been uh, issued to uh, some of the less fortunate people of Iraq. One of the things we're very uh, proud of is uh, our work with the, with the children and with the schools here in Iraq. When we first got into the country, I, I gave the order that each uh, company would uh, adopt at least one school. To date, we have 35 schools that we've adopted in, in our area of operation. When school started back this fall, we were able to deliver 26,000 backpacks to those children. Uh, each of those backpacks were full with pens, paper, uh, rulers, things that children need in order to be able to get started in school off on the right foot. We were also able to provide desks and chairs, table, uh, chalkboards for the instructors to also help them do a better job as far as educating children. Uh, all told, we've renovated 49 schools in our area of operation. So it, not only do we provide some of the, the, the uh, equipment for the children to, to get a good education. We've, we've increased the, uh, the ability of the, uh, the facilities for the, to provide a good place for them to, to, to learn. We, in, we uh, formed a pen pal program with five schools back in the state of Mississippi. Uh, and today uh, those schools are, are writing letters to uh, the children are writing letters to, uh, from Mississippi to children in Iraq. We're using our linguists to translate those letters so that the children can understand what's being said. And we're hoping that that will help uh, break down some of the cultural biases that, uh, that exist between the two cultures. As you know, in just a few days, we will uh, have an election. 
This is actually the third election that we've been a part of since we've been in Iraq. We arrived just in time to be a part of the first election in January, even though we had not completed the transfer of authority at that time. 75% of my brigade was on the ground, and we augmented the troops that were here during that, during that election. And also the uh, referendum vote on October 15th, uh, we were here for that. Both of those elections were very successful. Uh, we anticipate uh, the election in December to be even more successful. Uh, of course, we worked with the Iraqi security uh, uh, forces, the police, and the Iraqi army, the, uh, the, the governors and mayors of, uh, of, of each province, as well as the election commissioner, as uh, well as the, uh, the, the, the health, uh, the Minister of Health. We have a really good plan, so we don't see any problem with uh, this election being a, a success. <coughs> Excuse me. The Iraqi police and Iraqi army. <coughs> We, uh, we inherited a pretty good uh, situation when we got here in that we did have Iraqi police and Iraqi army. Uh, the problem we had was that they were not uh, as equipped as they, as they needed to be. Uh, for the past 11 months, we've been working very hard with getting weapons, with getting uniforms, getting communication equipment, and getting vehicles for them. And uh, as of right now, I think we're in pretty good shape. Uh, as, uh, there, none of the, those equipment shortages will stop them from being able to do their job. We've been able to uh, graduate 2,500 policemen from the uh, police academy. We think that's uh, outstanding. So not only do we have uh, policemen on the street who look like policemen, but they're actually are acting like policemen because the, the professional level of police has actually increased because we had so many to go through the academy. We uh, work very close with the Iraqi Army. Uh, we have three Iraqi Army battalions in our AO and uh, two Iraqi Army brigades. Uh, we work with them on a daily basis. We do operations with them. Uh, we do individual as well as squad and platoon level training with them. And uh, <clears throat> they have really increased in, in their ability since we first got here. Uh, we, uh, we've done some classes, uh, what you would probably know back in the States as a primary leadership development course, uh, where we uh, work with the non-commissioned officer corps of the Iraqi Army and help make them a more professional corps. The city of Najaf has uh, been in the news lately, and I just want to say a few things about uh, Najaf uh, while I have the opportunity. Uh, in my opinion, Najaf is a city that's on the move. <coughs> uh, I was uh, in Najaf in October 2004 before I, my brigade actually deployed overseas. I went downtown, and a lot of the buildings down there were abandoned. Uh, a lot of the buildings were uh, bullet-ridden from, uh, from the fierce fighting that had taken place in, in August. I was in some of those same places just recently, and the place is, uh, uh, is entirely different now. The buildings have been renovated, uh, the, the markets are open, there are people on the street, and, and everything is going in the right direction as far as the jobs concerned. <coughs> Tourism has increased. As you know, the Imam Ali Shrine is located in the Jaff, which is a very important shrine for, uh, as far as religious purposes for the uh, Shiite Muslims. And a lot of them are making their pilgrimages back to the, to, to the shrine uh, people who were afraid to do that under Saddam's regime. regime. A couple of uh, projects that we did down there that we're very proud of, one happens to be the Najaf Teaching Hospital. Uh, this hospital at one time was, uh, was filled with insurgents. They had taken the hospital over. Uh, the insurgents are gone now, but uh, when they left, they ransacked the place. Uh, they, they looted it uh, and left it in, in a bad uh, state of repair. We have uh, renovated two floors of this hospital. It's a six-story uh, structure, and it's open. And it's uh, treating about 400 patients per day now, but primarily on outpatients. And uh, <clears throat> our plan is to continue to work with that hospital until we get it up to 100% capacity. Uh, the Najaf Soccer Stadium, uh, also a very important uh, uh, project that we had going on in Najaf because uh, the people in Najaf didn't really have a place to go for uh, recreation. We renovated their soccer stadium, and about a month and a half ago, we were able to uh, dedicate that stadium with the, with the first soccer game between uh, Najaf and Baghdad. Uh, about 20,000 spectators showed up for this, this event. As far as the coalition forces in the city of Najaf, we're actually on the outside of, of the city. We, we had two uh, forward operating bases in Najaf at one time. Five Hotel, which is right on the city limits, we have, uh, we've uh, turned over that forward operating base over to the Iraqi army now. And, and we've moved all the coalition forces out to Fob Duke, which is about a 30-minute drive from downtown uh, Najaf. Right now, the, the uh, security responsibilities for Najaf is in the hands of the Iraqi police and Iraqi army. 
We're still there in an advisory mode, and we still conduct training with them on a daily basis, but they have done a great job as far as being able to uh, provide a safe and secure environment for the people of Najaf. We work very closely with the government of uh, Najaf, Karbala, and the Babel province. Uh, we form uh, provincial reconstruction and development committees in each one of those provinces, uh, which has coalition membership. It has members from the Department of State. It has members from the provincial council of each one of the provinces. Uh, and we identify the needs of the people of each one of those provinces, and we prioritize them. As funds come available, then we use those funds to execute contracts to provide for the needs of the people. That's worked out very well because we've had a good working relationship with the elected officials. As for the soldiers of the 155, uh, let me say uh, I think I served with the best that the, that the United States has to offer. Uh, the sacrifice and the service of these soldiers, uh, uh, they, they, they make me feel good every day. I can't say enough about them. Uh, and for the families uh, back home, I thank you for giving us loan to these soldiers for a year. And pretty soon we'll be able to turn them back over to you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm open for your questions at this time. Well, thank you, General, and that's an uh, enlightening overview there. I appreciate it. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, start with uh, Charlie here. Uh, General Charlie Ollinger with Reuters. It sounds like you're doing good things, especially in the education front, and I think you'd be congratulated for that kind of thing. Um, have a tax picked up recently in your area leading up to the, uh, leading up to the election? No, sir. The attacks have been pretty, pretty, uh, pretty level uh, recently. Actually, the attacks that we we have now, compared to attacks that we had when we first got here and, uh, and and took over our battle space in February, are at least uh, down by 50 percent. And uh, we attribute that to, of course, the, the active patrols that the soldiers are doing on a daily basis. Their interaction with the government, but probably more than anything, their interaction with the local people in each of the communities that we're responsible for. Uh, we first got here, the, the people didn't really talk with, to us that much, but now they've opened up to us, and they see that the, uh, the way to peace is through this democratic uh, uh, idea that we're, we're, we're trying to uh, share with them. So now what they're doing is actually working with us. Uh, they're helping us find the insurgents and, and uh, turn them over to us to where we can arrest them and get them off the street. Have you got any, uh, I'm sorry, have you got any numbers numbers on the attacks back when you started in January, February, and now? Actually, when we first got here, the, the attacks were uh, about uh, 200 per month, and, and now they're down to about 100 per month. And uh, not only did they uh, decrease in number, they decreased in effectiveness. Uh, and that's because, again, the, 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 the active patrols that, that we uh, conduct on a daily basis uh, the, the number of caches, weapon caches that we found in, in all of our areas, uh, we, we've taken a lot of the things that the enemy was using against us to, to, uh, to, uh, to try and uh, hurt or kill our soldiers. So now they don't have as robust uh, an inventory of things to use as they once did. And sorry, not meaning to press it, but, but these attacks, uh, are many of them IEDs? Or are you talking about uh, Shia and Sunni violence, that kind of thing? What, what, what kind of attacks are you talking about? Well, the, the attacks, and obviously the weapon of choice for the insurgency is the IED, uh, but we were getting a lot of indirect fire attack on our operating basis when we first got here uh, to, the, to the point that we were getting an attack at least every other day somewhere in our, our area. Now those are, those are down to about one every three weeks now, and uh, that's because we've, uh, we've captured a lot of the people that were actually doing the firing on us, and uh, the, the, the local people are actually telling us you know, if someone takes a shot, they tell us where they live and we go and pick them up. We don't have uh, a lot of documented uh, evidence of uh, Sunni on Shia violence in our AO. Not to say that it's not happening, but we don't have any, any documented evidence to, to be able to say that, that that's a, a big factor in our AO. Hi, this is Pam Hess with United Press International. Um, on the attack numbers that you gave us, are those mostly clustered in North Babiel province? And, and could you talk in more detail about um, that area? Because it's, it's obviously quite different from Najaf. And then also if you would talk about Muqtada Sadr, his organization, and, and if he pops up at Najaf from time to time, what, what you make of him and with this upcoming election. Ma'am, let, let me get you to, uh, to ask the very first portion of your question one more time. I didn't get that. 
Could you walk us through, North Babil province is different in threat um, and ge demographic makeup than Najaf and Karbala. Could you explain to us the, the, the difference there and, and what the threat is there and perhaps if Iraqi security forces are, um, are, are ready to take over? Uh, yes, ma'am. And yes, ma'am, obviously the, uh, the, the, the threat of attack in uh, Najaf and Karbala is much less than what you will find in North Babel. Uh, most of the IED attacks and the indirect fire attacks actually happen in North Babel as opposed to happening in Najaf or Karbala. So the, the area around North Babel was, was much uh, more dangerous than the other two provinces. Uh, but again, <clears throat> we've been able to reduce the number of attacks in that area also. Uh, uh, we, uh, we were very active uh, when we first got uh, in, into our area of operation, and we engaged the local population, and like I say, that has really paid off. As far as uh, Muqtada al Sadr, uh, of course, he's down in the job. And uh, to this point, he really hasn't caused us uh, any trouble. We know he's down there. Uh, occasionally, you'll see uh, some of the Mahdi militia out on the street. <clears throat> this is normally on the, the Friday of, at prayers down at the Kufa Mosque, but uh, they're peaceful. Uh, I think that uh, Al Sadr uh, understands that uh, you know the, the way uh, to uh, being successful uh, in, in this country is he, he's got to uh, maintain a, a peaceful uh, attitude at least through the elections. So I, I don't see him doing anything that's going to uh, uh, cause us any problems. Um, clarify for me what his legal status is, because last I checked, there was a, a, an Iraqi arrest warrant out for him. Um, what what's happened with that? He was uh, implicated in the Al Kohi. Um, murder, and uh, they announced that in 2004, uh, just before Najaf blew up in the, in the spring, that uh, there was an arrest warrant for him. Uh, to, to my knowledge, there, there's no current arrest warrant for uh, Al Sadr. Uh, matter of fact, uh, and, and also he hasn't been tried or convicted of any type of crime, so uh, as far as we're concerned, he's just another citizen down in Najaf. Uh, General, this is Bob Burns with Associated Press. Uh, in your opening remarks, you mentioned the uh, graduation of Iraqi policemen from the academy. I was wondering whether your soldiers, in what way are they involved in the training of, of policemen, uh, or do they staff the academy, for example? Uh, no, no, sir, we don't staff the academy. Actually, these are academies that are, that are established uh, uh, in Baghdad and, and also in Jordan and uh, also down in, in, uh, in the Babel province. Uh, our, our involvement as far as the, uh, the Iraqi uh, police is concerned, we assist the Iraqi uh, police in screening and uh, actually selecting the guys that, that actually uh, become part of the, uh, of the police force. And, and, uh, and the only thing we really do as far as screening is they have a physical exam, they have to have uh, proof of, uh, of, uh, of education, uh, and they have to take a, uh, an actual physical fitness exam. We, we assist in that and we do some background checks to make sure that none of these uh, individuals are on a, uh, a list of uh, terrorists that we're actually looking for. And then we provide, uh, help provide transportation for them to go to the academy. And uh, at, when we first got here, we were actually providing uh, transportation from the academy back to, to their homes. But the last uh, three uh, shipments of uh, police to the academy that, that we've had, the Iraqi police have actually provided that security, and that's also a, a, a big uh, story for us, a big success story. Mike. General, it's Mike Mount with uh, CNN. If we can go back to uh, North Babil province um, quickly. I uh, saw a press release a few weeks back that said uh, the Iraqi army had actually taken over in the, uh, in the Babil province. Can you tell us what level the Iraqi uh, army uh, or Iraqi security forces are actually operating uh, in, that, uh, in that province and to what kind of success uh, they're having over there? Well, I, I can tell you that the Iraqi army and uh, in Najaf and Karbala have responsibilities for those, those two provinces right now. We're, st we're just in an advisory and training mode as far as those provinces are concerned. In the North Babel area, uh, we have given them a small portion of uh, the North Babel area around the city of Iskandaria. Uh, the rest of that battle space up there, we're still actively patrolling with the coalition forces. And that's just a, 
uh, I guess you could say, kind of a test to see how well they do. So far, they're doing a very good job in that area. Uh, when we first got to the North Babel area, we only had two companies of Iraqi army in that area, and they were very uh, under strength at the time. Since then, we've improved that company, those two companies, to a full battalion of uh, over 800 soldiers. And uh, we, they, they were green when we first got them, so we did a lot of training with them uh, to the point now that they're ready to go out on the street and, uh, and do their job. I, I, I see with the unit that comes in and replaces us that that battalion will get a larger portion of the battle space uh, because I think they're, they're really coming along pretty fast. Jeff. All right, General, Jeff Shogel with Stars and Stripes. The Defense Department Inspector General's Office has issued an audit to see if the soldiers in Iraq have everything they need. Do, you, do, you, excuse me, do your soldiers have all the equipment they need, and have you had any supply problems in the past? I, I think our soldiers have all the equipment that, that, uh, that's necessary to be able to get the job done, the type of mission that we have. Uh, obviously, you know, through the supply system, occasionally you may have a, a problem or it takes a few days to get stuff uh, through the supply system, but none of that has ever affected our mission. Uh, we've never had to uh, cancel any missions while we were here because of any type of equipment issues. We've always had plenty uh, from, the, from the very first time that we got in, into theater and uh, took over our battle space from the, uh, from the units that were here previous. Uh, that equipment, the equipment that they had was handed off from them to us, so we fell in on what they had. And then we got additional equipment as we were going along. So I, I don't think uh, equipment issues have been a, a problem as far as us being able to accomplish our mission. Courtney? General, it's Courtney QB from NBC News. Um, for next week's elections, you said that the Iraqi police are, have the role in security, or have the lead in the security. Um, does that mean that next week they'll take the lead in security for the elections as well? And if so, what role would, will the U.S. Army play in security? Well, of course, up to this point, as far as elections have, have been concerned, uh, we've been the, the advisors. Like I said, we've had a, a number of meetings with, with all the, uh, the people who are involved with the elections, and we've come up with plans. I, I won't get into them, but I think we've got good plans. The Iraqi police and the Iraqi army uh, have the lead as far as uh, being out on the street on election day, uh, providing uh, security for the polling sites as well as providing security for the, uh, for the ballots as they move back and forth and going back to the, uh, to the warehouse after the election. Uh, and uh, we've got 100% uh, uh, of, of the Iraqi police and Iraqi army that will be involved in that, uh, in that, that mission on election day. The coalition forces, uh, of course, will be on, on, the, on the outside. We'll be on the periphery. Uh, We'll be in, in radio contact with them all day. If, uh, if there's a need for a coalition forces to, to be involved in, in some type of incident, then we will. But uh, right now, based on the last two elections and uh, I think the progress that the Iraqi security forces have made, we really don't anticipate uh, having to do anything on election day. We're going to need to bring us to a close. But Jim, go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> General Jim Mannion from my Jean's France Press. Uh, in, in some areas, for example, in, in Basra, there's been problems with <coughs> militia infiltrating the uh, security forces, mainly the police. Uh, I, I'm wondering whether militia influence in the police is a problem in your area, and if it is, how you're dealing with it. And it, as part of that, um, or as a related part of that, uh, is there any evidence of Iranian efforts to, to infiltrate or, or influence these, these security forces that are standing up? Well, obviously there are going to be efforts uh, to, to infiltrate the, uh, the security forces, but uh, as I, I was mentioning before, uh, we, we get involved with the, uh, with the Iraqi police in particular as far as this, the screening of the, uh, the candidates for, for to be policemen. And we do background checks on, on in, each individual as well as have the, uh, the, the station uh, uh, chief uh, there. And, uh, and the Iraqis know each other, so they know who's who uh, in, in their community. So they don't allow uh, people who are going to do things adverse to what they're trying to do as far as security to in, enter their ranks. So I, I, I don't see it as, as being a problem. I won't say we don't have any because I, I can't tell you that truthfully that we don't have any because I don't know. But I don't see it as being a problem right now. And I'm sure if it becomes a problem that the, uh, the district chiefs and the provincial police chief will, will handle that when it comes up. 
General, we have reached the end of our time, and I do appreciate you taking the, the time this evening to, to talk to us and uh, tell us about what your unit's been doing for the last 11 months. Uh, let me just turn it over to you to see if you have any uh, final comments that you'd like to make before we bring this to an end. Well, uh, Mr. Whitman, th thank you for allowing me to come and uh, spend some time with you today. Uh, I'd just like to say that uh, for the last 11 months, I've had the opportunity was to serve with uh, the absolute best soldiers that the United States has to offer. Uh, every day, they, they surprise me with, uh, with the, their level of commitment. Uh, I, I, I just want to say thank you to them for their, their service, for their sacrifice, as well as to their families. I, I know it's a great sacrifice for the soldiers to be here for a year, but it's also a sacrifice for the family to be without the soldier for a year. And I'd just like to say thank you to them. To the families of, of the soldiers uh, who were killed in action over here, uh, I'd just like to say that uh, you know, words can't express the grief that we have. Uh, uh, those soldiers were our friends. We, we fought alongside of them. Uh, we miss them, and they will always be heroes in our eyes. Thank you. Thank you, General, and uh, we wish you and your troops all the best.